That's what Ryan just said. <laughs> anyone? Uh, anyone? So not Zechariah, but I was doing it. Well, yeah, yeah. So we have one <laughs> person that the other probably would. <laughs> just kidding. I thought that was. Um, actually, I was reading. My, my, I have a Bible reading plan, you know, for the year, and I follow up the same plan every year. But if you get through the New Testament like two times. And you get through the Old Testament one time. And so this last week, I'm in Zechariah. <laughs> now you read through uh, Proverbs once a month. And you read through the Psalms a couple of times. Almost two times. One and a half times. Uh, no, I'm sorry, two and a half times. The point is, I came across this little scripture this morning. And he says in this scripture, you know, you guys, you come into my house and you do all these things and you think that doing these things is what I want from you. But to that old chorus we just sang, what he wants is our heart. Amen. What he needs is our obedience. That's the, that's the sign that he has our heart. When he gets our obedience and we give that to him as well and he's got what he wants so you're asking yourself, well, I know what's coming up. It's time to take up the office. So why is he talking about that? Because that's a part of our obedience. And it's not that he wants that from you. He wants that for you. Mm -hmm. I noticed that he put up a, um, on Facebook, he put up a, a celebration that we were able to give gifts and feed four families. Did that. Oh, Lord in heaven. It was you guys. <laughs> Y'all did it. So that's why it was put up there so you could celebrate what was done. And so what I'm saying is there's a practical, I mean, a really practical side to giving. Because giving demonstrates ministry that we are preparing to do. So there's an action that takes place before the result, the other action. We're going to go on a mission trip this next summer. But there's going to be giving before that mission trip happens. So join with God in, in obedience. When he calls us, when he says, hey, this is not Carl, I want you to pay attention to this. He isn't just saying, I want to give you information. He's saying, I want you to respond by doing this. That's God's call on our heart, on our lives. So, gentlemen, at this time, would you come and receive our morning offering? Do we have any gentlemen? We have? We do. Look at that. Look at that gentleman. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Oscar, would you lead us to the Lord in prayer, please?
have started to stop our singing. But I got to tell you something. On that second verse, we just sang, Born a king on Bethlehem's plain. Gold I bring to crown him again. And then we took a big breath. But that's really not the end of the thought. Gold I bring to crown him again. King forever. Ceasing never. Amen. Over us. Over us all. To reign. That's the king to celebrate. This one. While shepherds watch their flocks by night, all seated on the ground, the angel of the Lord came down and glory shone around. And glory shone around. Jackson has come and shared God's word with us this morning. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for gifted people who have written so many wonderful things that express the desires of our heart. God, to give you glory, to lift your name and praise, to tell you thank you for the wonderful gift that you gave us. And it's a gift that is simply couldn't have been given by anyone else, God. But there is a gift that redeemed us, that, that substituted us himself and his perfection for our sin and for our faith. And he took on himself for all of our sin. And his blood, he washed us clean. And just like the sacrifice in the old system of temple sacrifice, the blood was sprinkled on our altar, his blood was shed so that we could stand, he would stand before you in our stead. And we would be declared not guilty, not because of what we did. We have nothing to do with it. We can be declared guilty because of what Christ did on our behalf. To substitute himself as our Redeemer and our Savior. And when you announced in Luke chapter 2 that he was coming, you called him our Savior, our Messiah, and our Redeemer. So that he brings us redemption. 
he substitutes himself and he is the ruler and authority over all. So God, I pray you help us to honor him, to honor you in the ways that are appropriate, that we would live our lives to bring glory to you. Father, we lift up Pastor Jackson right now. We pray, Father, that as he brings the message that you've got on his heart, Father, that the Holy Spirit will open our hearts and our minds. Help us to receive it. Help us to apply it. And may we be true to our God. May we walk away from this place in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You guys can be seated. All right, we'll give the worship team just a few seconds to get to their seat as well. If you want to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Uh, notice we've uh, taken a break this uh, week. Um, usually, you know, we're studying uh, the book of Acts. We're actually in Acts chapter 13, but uh, we took a little break. And I thought it's a very seasonal for us to be able to continue the story of Christmas and what that means to us as believers today. So, will you join me? Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 and 15. When you think of a father figure in your life, who would that be? This is my question for you. Uh, could it be your father? Uh, an uncle? A uh, leader at church? Sunday school teacher? Who would that be? When I think of a father figure, I cannot help myself to think of these characters. So we're going to look at the screen and we're going to do a little test to see if you know who these, uh, these fathers are. So first one on the screen. Okay? So if you live in, you know, if you're kind of raised in the early 2000s, actually 2010 and so forth and so on, you'll know who this guy is. Who is this guy? Gru. Gru, that's right. Okay. That was pretty easy, right? Well, I think it's going to be a little bit harder, okay? So next one, when you think of a father, who is this gentleman? Right there in the middle. Raymond, right? Everybody loves Raymond. Okay. What about this? See, these, this is this is my show now. These are the shows that I watched when I was younger. Do you remember who that is? I don't remember his name. That's that's Steve Urkel right there to the to the bottom left. That's not the father, right? Um, that's Carl Winslow. Remember Carl? Oh, Carl! Come on, Carl! Next one. Okay, who's that? Okay, who's the, who's the father? Danny Tanner, okay? So if you look at that, uh, you can tell someone is probably still incarcerated in that picture. Um, Aunt Becky, I think, right? Uh, doing some hard time at the federal federal level there. Anyways, that's a little side joke. Okay, so you got got Bob Saget as Danny Tanner. How about this? This is my favorite right here. Who's this? Oh one in the center. Okay, what's his name? Okay, also known as? Hannibal. That's right. That's right. My 18 guy right here. Okay. All right. Next one. Uncle Phil. Uncle Phil. That's right. Okay. Next one. You guys will know this. Mr. Brady, right? You like those, you like that hair? Okay, next. Who's that? That's Gomez. Okay, so many of you guys don't know who that is. Uh, you guys got to YouTube it. Okay, all right, next one. Andy Griffin, right? His name is what? Andy Taylor, right? All right, next one, last one. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Wilbur. Wilbur Post, right? Fantastic. All right. So all jokes aside, I think we can learn some valuable truths from not these men, all right? Although they were part of our kind of upbringing, right, for some of you guys. Uh, but I think um, there's some truth about what we can learn about Joseph as well. So Jesus is earthly father who plays a key role into the life of Mary, his wife, the, and laying the foundation milestone for Jesus the Messiah. So if you want to uh, stand up in reverence of God's word, we're going to read Matthew chapter 2, uh, verse 13 to 15. 
Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for a child to kill him. So Joseph got up, and the child and his mother, while there, it was still night, left for Egypt. He stayed there until the death of Herod. This happened that what has been spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled. Out of Egypt I called my son. You may be seated. So you guys know the Christmas story. And, uh, if you were here for Christmas Eve or have read the Christmas story during the holidays, uh, we see the story of Joseph here. Jesus comes, right, in the line of David. So in the book of Matthew, it records the paternal side of, of Jesus, right? And then in the book of Luke, it records the maternal side. So there are 14 generations from Adam to David, 14 generations from David to the deportation to Babylon, and 14 generations from Babylon to the New Testament. So as we see here, Jesus is prophesied. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and she will be, shall name him uh, Emmanuel. So they were engaged at this time, right? Joseph and Mary, they had the betrothal uh, period where for one year they were engaged, marriage, but not they were not physical towards each other, if you know what I mean. So Mary remains a virgin. Joseph was a good man. He didn't want to disgrace her, but planned to divorce her secretly under the betrothal period. A man can vacate for this time period a uh, 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 reason for divorce for any reason, right? So let's say if the wife doesn't cook his meat right, let's say he wants medium rare and she cooks it really well, he has every right to divorce her under this period. But to bring to not bring shame for the woman, he, right, he keeps his vows. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. And he sees in a vision, right, an angel appears to him in a dream telling him not to divorce her. So he takes the child, he takes the mother, and cares. And, 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 and therefore, Jesus was born. So this is scene two, and I'm just kind of recapping. This is scene two of the Christmas story. You see, Joseph respond when the angel appears to him the second time. These are There are truths that we can learn about Joseph who comes, who becomes Jesus' earthly father, legal guardian, per se, so that he can claim to be the Messiah as God prophesied and planned. So this is where we are where we are today, and we're going to talk about just these four, these three verses here on what the crucial role of Joseph is. Is right, and what a father uh, uh, implicates in his in his son. So G God uses ordinary people like Joseph to do amazing things for His kingdom. God is using you as fathers today, using you as mothers too, to shape and mold your your child. And we will see that, but we also see the reverence of who the Lord is in Joseph's life. So my point number one is the father follows the Lord's call. The Father follows the Lord's call. This is a sermon about us as fathers. As I prepare this, it speaks to me a lot as well in areas in, in my life that I need to heed to the Lord. And I pray that we would use this time to remind us, fathers, all those fathers here, of the implications that we have as we raise our boys and our girls to love the Lord passionately, to follow the Lord passionately. So my point number one is, the Father follows the Lord's call. The Father follows the Lord's call. It says there in verse 13, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said to him, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Firstly, this is the second appearance from the angel, the same angel of the Lord. The first was when Joseph was a righteous man who wanted to secretly divorce. He had thought about this he uh, in his mind and how he's going to do this. Because she was pregnant during the betrothal period. Now again, the baby Jesus was born, the same angel appears to Joseph again. So if you believe in the angel the first time, you must believe in the angel the second time. Secondly, it is a significant message 
that required action. And this is what we're going to kind of hinge on a little bit here and camp on a little bit. This word, get up, is also translated in some of your Bibles as rise up. And it's not like rise up passively, it's rise up actively. What's really cool about this in the Greek language is this verb uh, called agario. Agario. Okay, it's an arrowless verb. So when we think of verbs, we have, uh, when we think of tenses, we think of time, right? We have past tense, right? And then we have present, and then we have what? Future tense, right? But in the Greek, they like to kind of make it hard for us, right? They, they have different tenses. And this tense is called an airless tense. It's a verb in action. And it's, it's, it's done in a way, it's, it's said in a way that it's, it's done where you have to command. You have to follow the commands of what the angel had said. So for instance, let me give you an example of an airless tense. An airless tense says, I hit the ball well yesterday, okay? So, right? An imperfect tense, imperfect verb says, I was hitting the ball well yesterday. Does that make sense? Okay? So, uh, similar for Christmas, for me, I ate a lot during Christmas Eve. Okay? That's an errorless tense. But in an imperfect tense, it says, I was eating a lot during Christmas Eve. You see the difference? So the thing is, is that with eros tense, it's that it's done in force. It's, it's this verb in action, in force, that you need to get up. You need to rise up right away. You can't wait any longer. You can't say, hey, when, when, it's, you know, when the weather feels better, then, I, then I'm going to get up. And you'll see that in Scripture. It says there, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, take that child and his mother and flee to, uh, to Egypt. Joseph knew the urgency of this message by the angel, that anything short of it would be devastating for his wife, his child, this newborn, and himself. Urgency of following through in the Lord's command. Failure is not an option at this point. It could be detrimental for his life, his wife's life, and this baby Jesus. So just as much as it is detrimental, it could be detrimental for them. It could be detrimental for us. So this message is a charge for us men to get up. Get up. Right? We've had a rough year. 2020, it's been rough. But we need to get up. There's a lot of things that we need to do as men. And I want to challenge us men to take the throne that God has for us, to take the place that God has set up for us at homes, in our businesses, etc., in life, in our community. Luke chapter 5, verse 4 to 11 says this. Now when he, Jesus, had finished speaking, he said to Simon, this is the calling of the disciples. He said to Simon, put out into the deep water. Because remember, Simon and his brothers and, and business partners were career fishermen, right? He said, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon responded and said, Master, we work hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. So it's kind of like a passive way of saying, okay, well, I'll let you do it, fine. And then, verse 6, when they had done this, they caught a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats to the point that they were sinking. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions, his business partners, because of the catch of the fish which they had taken. And likewise also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. Do not fear. For now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed them. See, this is the same call. This is the same urgency that we as men, we need to get up. We need to listen to the Lord. We need to do what he has commanded us to do. We need to follow the Lord's plans. You see, Jesus was going to use these blue collar, these ordinary guys, average men to accomplish amazing things that will ultimately change the world from that day forward. 
He chose 12 men. He commands them to follow him as he illustrates that he is the goat. Not, not the goat that with an animal. He's the greatest of all time in fishing. After all, he created the fish anyways and all that it touches, right? He calls these disciples to yield their lives, their livelihood, and to follow him daily. This is not a weekend warrior, you know, army reserve thing that you sign up, right, on, on every other weekend. But a lifetime commitment to follow Jesus as an enlisted soldier, full-time in active service. Luke 9, 23 says this, and I love this, this passage. And he, Jesus, was saying to them, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself. See, the hardest thing is you, you, we rationalize in, my, in, our, in our minds, I don't have to do that. Not yet, God. No, there's urgency. Get up. Is what God is saying. Take up your cross daily and follow me. You have to take it daily. Not just during Sundays. Not when there's food. <laughs> not when there's, it's fun. It's when you do it when it's not so fun sometimes. And when you don't have the energy sometimes. When you don't want to, you just want to throw in the towel sometimes, right? Get up, man. A.W. Tozer says this. If I am to holy, hold, uh, to, to holy follow the Lord Jesus Christ, I must forsake everything that is contrary to him. So you must hate anything that is against Christ. You must hate. We have to fight that as brothers and sisters in the Lord. David Platt, whom I cherish and admire, um, said this, the road that leads to heaven is risky, lonely, and costly in, uh, in this world. And if you are willing to pay the price, following Jesus involves losing your life and finding new life in him. So you have to fight that. And he talks about that in Romans. You have to fight against the flesh because sometimes we just don't want to listen. Sometimes we don't want to follow what God has called us to do. We just want to sit. We want to sit on our couch and just, you know, use our remote control and look at our phone. There's so much more. You are made more than those things. So I just want to remind you and encourage you as brothers and sisters in the Lord, right? The Father follows the Lord's call. That's what Joseph did. And that is what God needs to tell us that we need to do today. Number two, point number two, the Father obeys the Lord's command. The Father obeys the Lord's command. Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still a night and left for Egypt. Notice that what the angel was telling him to go, to go to Egypt where it's hot and it's humid. Desert, actually not humid, it's desert, it's dry. But there's a lot of significance about Egypt, right? As we read in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Exodus. If you recall, Egypt was a house of bondage of, to Israel for 400 years. And particularly for the Egyptians, for they were cruel to the infants of Israel. Yet it was to be a place of refuge for the holy child, Jesus. God, when, he's, when, he, was, when he pleases, he can make the worst of places severe the best, and, and, and make it best. So what, what I'm saying is, it could appear to be a really bad place, but with God, when God is in it, he can make it really good. This was a trial for the faith of Joseph, you see? Sometimes God calls you to do amazing things, extraordinary things, things that you can't even fathom and articulate in your mind. But when God calls you to do it, you need to follow through, because it is significant. Right? Faith comes from hearing and doing what the Lord has commanded to do. Yes, it might be unorthodox. It might be a bit unusual. But when God calls, we must obey, be obedient in his calling. Right? So here's my charge for you. Fathers, obey. Obey. Right? We have children that follows us. What you say or what you don't say, how you say things and how you ought not to say things, they will see that in you. And for many of you guys, elderly gentlemen here who have kids and grandkids already, great grandkids, you know that this is significant, right? So I would just want to encourage you to obey the Father. Obey the Father. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I love this verse, says this, verse 26 to 27. 
So consider your calling, brothers and sisters, that there are many, there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that which are strong. So you might not have everything. You might not have all the education and the support and, and, and a great upbringing, but God still calls you. See, he doesn't call the perfect. There's none that's perfect. He calls those that have the heart for him. That's all he, who, who he's after. So let us re be reminded. He doesn't call you to be perfect. He calls you to be holy to him. And he will make you perfect. With God on your side, you can prove to be, uh, you can prove to all the haters and the naysayers, right, the doubters, that they're wrong. Because you have a God that's in you. Holy Spirit descends to you as, as he has promised. When faced with an issue and a decision as fathers, always, always yield to the Lord's command and his laws and his principles grounded in his word and his laws. I challenge you not so much on how you feel or what's popular, right? We need to respond in obedience to him and it might be something so weird God still calls us to do so. So I want to challenge you with that. Romans chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. I know I'm just giving you tons of scripture. I hope you write this down, right? I hope you write this down. This is, these are God's words. Romans chapter 2, verse 12 to 13 says this. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Verse 13, this is so key. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God. But the doers of the law who will be justified. You see, justification is a legal word that says, I'm going to remove the sin from you. I'm going to justify you. I'm going to make you clean again. It's as if the judge was laying down the law and saying, you're forgiven. I'm going to make you into something special as a father. Following the Lord's command is a blessing beyond your comprehension. Comprehension. It is a blessing to you, your children, to your children's children, and to your future generations to come. Don't waste the opportunity as fathers. Right? If this was not true, if this wasn't true, let, let's just kind of, uh, this is an ad lib here, it's not in my notes. If God poured forth fathers, I wonder how our world would be different if it wasn't that makes sense. If he doesn't force the fathers to stand up, could our world be very different? It could be worse. If you think about it. So what that does tell you is that this is true. Psalms 1, um, I think about this, I, I've never visited the Redwoods before, but you guys know what the Redwoods are, right? Right? This is Northern California. Uh, if you visit there, I want to warn you, I'll be praying for you if you visit California. But anyways, um, so if you've been to the Redwoods, you see these massive oak, right? These Redwoods, right? And it's not just one Redwood standing by itself. What's great about it is there are many Redwoods around it. And it's not just the depth of the roots that fall in that's so buried in the ground. It's Redwoods around close to it that it, the roots intertwine together. That makes them stronger together. So if you think about that, I'm going to read Psalms chapter 1. I've read this before, and I'm sure you have to think of those redwoods. So it says here, verse 1 says, Blessed is a person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. So he's saying, if you, if you want to be righteous with the Lord, don't go to places where there are all these people. Okay, number one. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He gets up thinking about God's word, and he goes to sleep thinking about God's word. He will be like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In whatever he does, he prospers. Wow. The wicked are not so. But they are like chaff, which the wind blows away. 
Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So God calls us, God calls us to stand strong, to obey his word, right? So we went through the father, the father that follows the Lord's call, the father that obeys the Lord's commands. Now the father that waits for the Lord. So Joseph in verse 14 of Matthew chapter 2 says this, so Joseph got up and took the child. So he got up. He didn't wait. And his mother, while it was still night. You see, the, it, was, it was evident to them how significant this is. And left for Egypt. He stayed there until the death of Herod. This happened so that what has been spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled. Out of Egypt, I called my son. See, the Lord illustrates complete control and governance over his people. Here Joseph awaits for the Lord until the threat has been silenced for God to continue his work through the life of Jesus the Messiah. This is quoted in Hosea chapter 11 verse 1. Out of Egypt I have called my son. As the word stated when the Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. They refer beyond the shadow of that to the history of Israel as being a special sense among all the nations of the world, the chosen son of Jehovah. See, he was predicted, he was prophesied for him to come and do this. And they fell through the tea, right? They fell through and the, the process of God's sovereign plan and sovereign will that Jesus would be coming out of Egypt. See, a father waits as he's waiting for Herod to die. He waits. What does he do? Does he wait in pity? He waits in anticipation. He waits, and we don't know too much about it. But I know he brought the son back. He brought his family back. So your father waits because God is planning something out. He's working behind the scenes. He's preparing us fathers. He's preparing our hearts. He's preparing our soul for something that we cannot even imagine. That is God. See, this word wait is very interesting. It occurs more time in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Psalms. And we're going to go through and read some, some of those verses than any other book in Scripture. But if you look at Psalms, right, it occurs 38 times. You, who, who wrote most of Psalms? David. Who is Joseph's great, 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 Anointed by Samuel the prophet as future king of Israel right after King Saul. Since his anointing, he waited, wait, he waited for more than 20 years, plus years, to be the king of Israel. He was a shepherd boy first, right? Anointed king. You see, David had something special. He was a gifted outdoorsman. He kills a lion and a bear. Oh my. He loved spending time alone with God. He was a gifted musician, gifted writer. He was a father, a grandfather, a military leader, conqueror, warrior. He was a man of bloodshed, but he was a man of emotions as well. He was a man that was depressed. He was a man that made mistakes that affected generations on after him. But he was a righteous man. A man of faith, referenced in Hebrews chapter 12. He was the great grandfather of Joseph, Jesus' earthly father. So I'm going to read to you just a short, these short verses on weight. This word weight in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Psalms. And as if you think about it, as I'm reading, think of David as he's writing this down. As he waited out in the field, knowing that he's the anointed. There was some grooming that needed to happen. There were some areas of his life that God was going to shape as he waited for the Lord. You see, a father knows how to wait. Right? The father is not impatient. Psalms 27, 14 says, wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Psalms 25, verse 3, indeed, none of those who wait 
for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacher treacherously without cause will be ashamed. If you wait, you will not be ashamed. Psalms 25, 5, same chapter. Lead me to your truth and teach me, for you are the God of salvation, for I wait all the day. Psalms 25, 21. Let integrity and uprightness protect me, for I wait for the Lord. So think about this. As you're waiting for the vaccine, waiting for this year to be over, think in the context of this in Psalms. Psalms 27, 14 says this, For the Lord God, be strong. Let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. You see this paternal, masculine side, right? But there's also the feminine side that waits patiently for the Lord. Psalms 31, 24 says, Be strong. Let your heart take courage. All of you wait for the Lord. Psalms 33, 18 says this, Behold, the eyes of the Lord is on those who fear him and on those who wait for his faithfulness. Psalms 33, 20, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Sometimes God doesn't give you what you want because he's protecting you. He's still molding you. He's, 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 he's carving out those all impurities outside. And is building you from the inside. Psalms 37, 7 says this. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not get upset because of one who is successful in his ways. So think of business, right? Because of a person who carries out wicked schemes. Wait for the Lord who are faithful. Same chapter, verse 9. For evildoers will be eliminated. For those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit. Verse 34 of Psalms 37, wait for the Lord and keep his way. He will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are eliminated, you will see it. So as you wait for the Lord, you will see goodness and evil. But you stand in the goodness because you wait on the Lord. Psalms 38, 15, for I wait for you, Lord. You will answer the Lord, my God. See, it's waiting in anticipation that God is going to deliver. Psalms 37, 9, for now, Lord, what do I wait? My hope is in you. Psalms 40, verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord. He reaches down to me and heard my cry. Psalms 42, verse 5 and 11, and I'll just say this. Why are you in despair, my soul? Why are you restless within Wait for the Lord, for I will again praise him for the help of his presence, my God. Verse 11, why are you in despair? It's almost the same verse. It says, wait for the Lord, for I will again praise him for the help of his presence, my God. So it's almost saying, I'm waiting for you, but I'm going to praise you as I'm waiting for you. Because I know you're going to deliver. It's, it's being reassured that you're not just praying out loud, going into deaf's ear. You're, God is listening. But it, not yet. I'm going to build character in your life. Right? A few more and I'll be done. Psalms uh, 52 verse 9. I will praise you forever because you have done it. I will wait on your name for it is good in the presence of your godly one. So you almost see the end there. God is going to fulfill what he's going to fulfill. Just wait. Just wait just a little bit. God is doing his work. Psalms 62 verse 1 um, says this, My soul awaits in silence for God alone. For him comes my salvation. Part of our salvation story is waiting on the Lord for him to deliver, right? My soul waits in silence for God alone, for my hope is in him. Psalm 67, I'm sorry, 69 verse 3. I'm weary with my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes fail while I wait for the Lord. So these are the ones that are distressed. David, as it's recorded, has been depressed for all these years for many, many reasons. But God knows his crying. God knows his tears. God can understand and feel that. But he waits for the Lord because he knows that God is going to deliver. 
Psalm 69, 6. May those who wait for you not be ashamed because of me, Lord God of armies. May those who seek you not be dishonored because of me, God of Israel. And last but not least, uh, Psalm 71, 14. But as for me, I will wait continually. I will praise you yet more and more. Huh. So as you're waiting, you're not just waiting in tears. You're waiting in anticipation that as you wait, it's going to build character. It's going to build endurance. It's going to build stamina for what God is going to do for you. Wow. If that doesn't turn your fire, man, I don't know what, what would, okay? So we went through the Father follows the Lord's call. The Father obeys the Lord's commands. And the Father waits for the Lord. I want to encourage you. Before we turn into 2021, think, recap, think about what God has done as and during this very difficult year of our lives. But as we wait for the Lord, God is going to deliver because He stands for us in His Word. So let me let me pray as we close. I want to pray for us, um, and then we'll get back to uh, Acts next week. But let me pray, Lord God, thank you so much for Your Word. I, we, you know, we we talk about the Christmas story. We even read about it, but do we really, really know what it means to wait? Do we really know what it means to obey? Do we really know what it means when you command us to do something? We need to do it, even if it's weird. And Lord, I pray as we come before you today. Thank you so much for showing us. The life of Joseph and what he's done. There's not much written about him, but these these key verses of what he has done for your son. So, Lord God, I, I come before you. Thank you so much, God, for showing that and illustrating for us men to really stand up and get up. This is not the time. This is not the time to just sit and wait. This is not the time for us to sour on the moment and just say, oh, oh, woe is me. This is the time to get up. Lord, I pray, Father, for the men here especially, and for the women. Lord, get us to where we need to be in you and in your word. I got up early this morning, Lord, just asking, Father, for you to forgive me in areas where I feel and for me to take the role that you have placed for me, in my family, in my workplace, in our church. And Lord, I pray that the men here would get up and to claim what you have for them. Call them. So thank you so much, Father, for hearing us today. Thank you for your word that stands for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, this is a uh, time for you to respond. Uh, this is the last time this year on a Sunday that you can respond. But, you know, if God moves in your heart, uh, if you want to seek prayer, uh, these are open for you. Joy and I will be here to be able to pray for you. Uh, if uh, you want to rededicate your life and just say, hey, you know what, I'm going to get my family together. We're going to pray. Because guess what? This year, we don't know how, what the year is going to unfold. But we're going to stand to the Lord. For he will sustain you. If you want to rededicate your life, I want to give you that opportunity. If you've never given your life to the Lord, I want to give you that opportunity. You want to make it right this year. You come.
standing strong for your name. I pray for a blessing for all of us. Give us this new year, new year that can change this world around for you. It's not over yet, Lord God. There's still work to do. Invigorate us, challenge us, Lord God. Give us the spirit so that we can be salt and light to this world. Father, give us those opportunities. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.